Well, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I'm here to tell a bit of a story today. Um, well, let's, let's crack on. What am I here to talk about? So, quantum computing. So, this is who I am. Uh, I work for ThoughtWorks. I've been working for ThoughtWorks for the last three years. Before that, I was working in a startup for nine years. And these days, I'm kind of an agile transformation specialist, which means I get all the stuff at ThoughtWorks where we go into companies that are broken and we try and get them less broken. I don't tend to get in my line of my work to work with cool technology. So this is a story of how I did get to work with some cool technology. So who's ThoughtWorks? I'm not going to spend much time on that. If you haven't heard of us, look us up. There's loads of books written by ThoughtWorks people. I have to put these slides on the board. As you can see, there's nothing about quantum computing yet. Maybe we can change that over time. OK. What have I found in Krakow? That's Dimitri. He just did his talk earlier. Sadly, I missed it. Uh, I bumped into him. I met him in Vienna, and we went out last night. Beautiful city, Krakow. I don't know if anybody here is from Krakow, but it's my first time. Uh, I love the buildings in Krakow. Um, it's great to find, you know, some European cities were destroyed in the 20th century. This one clearly wasn't, because there's some beautiful old buildings there. No idea what that building is, but it looks great. So does that one. And then, obviously, we had some dinner. The square, big square, looks fantastic. And I noticed something about the carriages. Even though, like most of Europe in Poland, you drive on the wrong side of the road, the people driving the carriages, as you can see, is actually, he's sitting on the correct side. He's driving on the right-hand side. And I noticed all the horse-drawn carriages were like that. And there's, there's another horse, which I, I took that photo for my daughter, really. We'll mention her later. And, of course, the evening ended with a beer, which meant that I spent this afternoon putting the finishing touches to, well, this morning, to this presentation. So, why am I here? What am I talking about today? Quantum computing, I'm going to go through... Uh, why I'm talking about it, a little bit about quantum mechanics, what we might use quantum computers for, how they're different to digital computers, what's out there at the moment, and then, my word, this is the first time I've ever done this, a live demonstration of some code. I've never had the courage to do code on stage before, so we'll see how that goes. And then a little bit of speculation on the future. So, here's my story. Uh, I stand in front of you now. I am certainly not an expert in quantum computing. This is the story of, of how... I have started to research it for my own um, hobby, effectively. And why did I get there? So, I was at a conference in Vienna uh, two, three months ago. And this chap here, is Alastair Collinson in the room by any chance? I don't see a hand up. That's good, because I was going to proceed with caution if he was. Uh, he spoke about quantum computing. As you can see, he's got something quantum looking in the background there. And he gave this presentation. Uh, and it was way over my head, so I thought it would be nice to do something that was not way over everybody's head. This is one of his own slides. You can see him there presenting it. So this gives you an indication of, of, of what Alistair was like. He, he was a very, very nice man, but I found it hard to talk to him. So I thought I could try and do a, a quantum computing talk that was on a slightly lower level than what Alistair delivered. So what then happened, here's him delivering his talk. Ah, yes. I then made a joke the following day after Alistair's speech about Schrodinger's cat. Uh, except I said, not Schrodinger's cat, it's Clementine's cat, which is my daughter. So we'll come back to her later. And as you can see, Clementine's cat is displaying the standard cat emotion. So, what then happened was, I made that joke, as you can see, in Vox Vienna. And there's me making a joke about, well, the one that you've just seen, basically. If you can be bothered to watch the video, there's a URL, but that was about microservices, the stuff that I normally get to talk about. So what then happened was I spoke to this man. Is Greg Orge in the room? No. And he said to me, can I put something into the CFP for his conferences in Poland? There's this one, and there's one again in Krakow in September. So I said, OK, yeah, I'd love to. I love talking at conferences. So um, I put my usual stuff in there. Microservices are not worth the trouble. And I just put this thing in. And I thought, you know, it, he won't pick that up. He knows I know nothing about it, but we'll see. But then some scary things happened. Firstly, that talk got rejected. And that talk got accepted, which made me feel like that. So 
I then started researching quantum computing. What am I going to stand in front of a group of people, many of whom probably know more than I do about the subject? How am I going to talk about quantum? So I did a, a ton of research. This is typically what my Chrome looks like these days, like that. that that's all about quantum stuff, and, that's all, and all of these are various places. And here's the block sphere. We'll come back to that later. Then I met this chap. He's one of my colleagues. I knew him already, and I happened to be chatting to him in a pub. And he said to me, um, oh, I'm, I'm interested in quantum. Should we pair on this? There's a, a ThoughtWorks conference, an internal thing happening this Saturday. So Duncan and I said, that would be great. You can give me some help. There's one thing you need to know about Duncan, which is this. So Duncan knows way more than me about quantum. And we've been pairing on a, on a, a presentation similar to this to give to the ThoughtWorks people internally. And without Duncan's help, I wouldn't have been able to do this. So I'm putting him on there, which because uh, he's been fantastic. So we also started going to some meetups. This woman, and I'm sadly I can't remember her name, and I didn't write it in the speaker's notes, which I can't see anyway because I've got the wrong thing on this screen. Ah, oh, well, never mind. I don't need the speaker's notes. She's from Microsoft. She's got a PhD in um, quantum physics, and she was talking to us about, ah, I've got my notes back, tremendous. But then I've got to do something with the clicker to make sure it works. She was talking to us about what Microsoft's doing in the quantum space. I went to a conference last week in France, Web Today, in Nantes, which was fantastic. Did anybody here go there? I can thoroughly recommend it. <laughs> thoroughly recommend it. I had the time of my life there. I saw this very interesting talk about quantum. Uh, this chap is a, a researcher of some I didn't, unfortunately, <laughs> when I saw this talk, I had the translation from French, but it kept breaking, so I, I got rid of it in the end. And then as I was doing all this research, I started to get inspired. And one, one thing that came up again and again and again is that quantum physics is, is encoded in nature. And this is why we should be interested in it. Um, apart from anything that this is a beautiful picture, I think. But, uh, so w what does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things. Um, something that I was going to talk about briefly is this convergent effort. Oh, I pressed the wrong button. My apologies. I'm going to ruin my own jokes as well. There you go. I was going to talk about convergent evolution, but then I had a quick word with Duncan this morning, and Duncan basically said that. So every time I'm getting slightly out of line and Duncan wants to say, no, 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 Bernie, uh, Duncan might pop up from time to time and tell me to uh, not go down a rabbit hole. So I'm not going to talk about convergent evolution. So let's move on. Quantum mechanics. Wow. <laughs> so I started off thinking I need to understand the basics of quantum mechanics in order to understand quantum computers. Now, I think that is still true. So what did I do? I took um, the talk that I'd seen in Vienna. I watched it again. I watched a lot of videos. And then uh, what I realized was, after a while, that this subject was really difficult. What I found was, and I equate this to when I started to learn closure. Every time you learn something new, you try and relate that new thing onto experiences that you already have. And the temptation with quantum mechanics is people often come up with things and start try to explain it in, in terms that they know that everybody's going to understand. But in terms of the physical world, what we as human beings understand is what we can see. We see things that have mass bouncing off one another. We know that particles exist. We instinctively can grasp how they behave. That's not the case with quantum. And there's, something, there's lots of things called quantum interpretations. The Copenhagen interp interpretation is, is probably the most well-known, which is where Schrodinger's cat comes from. But from what I've read about Schrodinger's cat, Schrodinger devised Schrodinger's cat as a way of mocking the, the interpretation, as a way of proving its absurdity. Uh, there's also something called the, the many worlds interpretation, which just blows your mind. So what I thought after a while was I wondered if it was even worth trying to relate quantum to, to my current understanding. So as, as the picture says, a bad analogy is like a leaky screwdriver. Uh, that, that's a joke that works quite well in English, but I'm guessing that not many people in this room speak English as a first language. But essentially, a bad analogy will confuse you further, and I, I suspect that's what's going on, so I kind of gave up. Um, so there's some universal truths that I've been adding to. The, the first one, I've, I've known this for decades, is 
Any country that has the word democratic in its official name is not democratic. They're such as, if we remember the old German Democratic Republic, yeah, good one. Who are they kidding? Uh, another universal truth, this is one that I've come to realize since I've worked for ThoughtWorks, is any organization where the CTO says to you, yeah, we're doing agile, yeah, they're not. <laughs> they, they just so aren't. And something that I've learned in the last few weeks of my research is this third thing, which is any individual you meet who claims they understand quantum mechanics does not understand quantum mechanics. And actually, Olivier, the French chap in the earlier slide, he said this himself when I was chatting to him. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but whoa, there goes Duncan. Sorry, I remember the, the lady from Microsoft, I think she understands quantum mechanics. So, mind you, she probably wouldn't claim she does because she's got a PhD, she doesn't need to claim it, so maybe it still holds true. <sighs> so, what did I do when it came to quantum mechanics and understanding it deeply? I just made a meme. Uh, this is, oh God, what's his name, Exhibit. Again, this might be an English cultural thing. They're supposed to be recursive memes. So the only way I thought I could learn about quantum computing was by using quantum computers. So that's what I did, and we'll come back to that later. So how do quantum computers work? <laughs> I shall endeavor to give you my best understanding of the space. I'm guessing everybody in this room knows what a, a bit in a classical computer is. I found this picture on the interweb, and look, it moves. If you look at it long enough, it changes color. That, I believe, is called a flip-flop, and that's, monitor, that's holding state. Uh, in one position, it lets current through one way, in another position, it lets through another way. So it's, 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 it's a bi-state system. It can be a zero or a one. It doesn't need to be zero or one, but we usually say it's zero or one. From what I've read, modern computers have distinct tiny voltages in transistors. Don't understand the exact electronics of it. Then you have logic gates. Effectively, a logic gate takes one or more inputs as a zero or one, and it outputs a zero or one on the other side. The key thing about logic gates in a classical digital computer is that um, they're so efficient that you can, you can piece together thousands of them. I, I don't know the exact uh, deal. But essentially, this is all digital computers do. They have bits, they go through logic gates, they change them or they map them onto another set of bits. And then all of that gets composed into the arithmetic that computers do. And that is it. That is all a digital computer does. Everything is maths. And here I've got a nice picture of it. Up there, we've got a, um, an OR gate. You can see that if either of the gates, A or B, is closed, either of those switches is on, the current goes through the light. Uh, it's actually depicting OR, but it would also work if both were switched on. You can see that. And this, this bigger picture here, this is a schematic I found on the interweb. The interweb's your friend for these things. Um, that is a description of how, um, I think it's 8-bit uh, uh, or 16-bit. No, hang on, looking at it. Yeah, it must be 16-bit. 16-bit floating point arithmetic is uh, implemented by composing together logic gates. So my point is you can compose together a lot of logic gates, which just give you primitive Boolean expressions, and you end up with what we understand as arithmetic. And then, of course, people have written higher order languages on top of that, lots of useful abstractions. Now, this is where we're starting to get into dangerous ground. <laughs> Does anybody in here understand what a qubit is? Wow. A couple of people have put their hands up. Um, I counted maybe five or six. So that probably means there's five or six people in this room that know more than I do about this stuff. You can talk to them afterwards. So a qubit is the standard store of information in a quantum computer. Um, there are, uh, it's this thing here, this is called the block sphere. My understanding, and it is my understanding, is that this represents the probability space of what that qubit will return as its value should you choose to measure it. Now, the key point about a, a qubit is that it encodes that probability space, so it, it effectively can hold more than one value. It, can, uh, it has something called superposition which means it can have more than one value. But when, as soon as you observe the value, as soon as you measure the value of a qubit, uh, something called state collapsing happens. The state collapses into that single value, and that qubit is no longer any good for any further computation, which, of course, places quite a limitation on the way that quantum computers can work. Please feel free to correct me if I got any of this wrong, those people that put their hands up there. Um, so that's a qubit. Uh, there are many different physical implementations of qubit. 
I understand very few of these. Um, but if you want, you can go to the Wikipedia page where I've got it there. Uh, what else do I need to say about qubits? Ah, yes, one more thing about qubits. Their state is... Um, it decays very, very quickly. So if you just leave a qubit alone, the state decays. So your quantum programs have to execute very quickly. Uh, and because they're prone to error, they're prone to losing state, their state leaks sideways into neighboring things. It literally does that. In order to get a useful logical qubit, uh, what you have to do to build your quantum computer is you have to compose uh, dozens or thousands or millions of physical qubits together to make a single logical qubit. And that, of course, makes it a very difficult task to construct a real quantum computer. We'll come back to that later. Like classical computers, logic gates exist. This is the set of logic gates here that is available on IBM Q, which if I get time, I'll show you. I've got a link to it anyway. Um, the easiest ones to understand are that top row. The ID gate does nothing, as you'd expect. The X, Y, and Z gates rotate the, um, the state of the qubit through 180 degrees in the block sphere. So uh, if, it's, if it's pointing to 1, you apply an X gate to it, it's then pointing to 0. Um, and the Y and Z spaces are different. I'm told that the block sphere represents four-dimensional vector space, but hey, who am I to argue with that? The Hadamard gate is the only other one that I barely understand which is um, what the Hadamard gate does is it, puts the, it imposes a superposition of state on, on, your, um, on your qubit so that it's holding both the 0 and a 1 with equal probability. And then later on, you measure the state of that qubit if it's, if it's undergone the Hadamard transform, and about 50% of the time it will tell you it's 0, and about 50% of the time it will tell you it's 1. And I haven't had... Well, I have read the descriptions of these, but until I understand quantum mechanics better, I'm afraid I'm none the wiser, so please don't ask me about them. But I'm happy to have a conversation over a beer with anybody that knows more than I do. Now, the, the interesting thing about uh, the way that one constructs a quantum computer and the way that one constructs logic gates is that, as far as I can tell, unlike the digital computer space, in order to program a quantum computer, the only things available to you really are the qubits and the gates. There are no higher order functions. There is no functional composition thus far, or at least there are some libraries, but there is no quantum programming language that can define some kind of quantum arithmetic. That's, I, I don't know if that's because people haven't done the work yet, or if it doesn't make sense. And this is something that I'm going to start examining um, with some of my colleagues. Um, because, and we'll see later when I give you a demonstration that uh, it's hard because of that. Yeah, there, there are, you have to get these concepts in order to, to get anything useful out of your quantum computer, which is something I didn't expect and made, and made all the research a lot more difficult than I expected it to be. Um, one, oh yeah, and one final thing to understand about logic gates. It, the logic gates in a quantum computer, when you pass your, your qubit through a logic gate or your qubits in, in the case of some of the transforms, they lose fidelity in the same way that doing nothing to them decays the state, so does going through the logic gates. So what that, those two things together mean that your, your quantum program is limited in its, its breadth and its depth. It's limited in its breadth by the number of qubits you've got available, and it's limited in its depth because every time you go through a logic gate, you lose a bit of fidelity. Um, so obviously you're limited by the number of operations that you can perform. We'll get around a bit to why that, those physical limitations exist. Now, this was part of the talk I saw at Microsoft. This was, um, I don't understand the physics, but they're working with something called the Majorama fermion. Uh, Majorama was an Italian physicist in the early 20th century uh, who theorized about a particle in much the same as the Higgs boson. The Majorana fermion was something that he theorized about, and it was only observed in a lab um, like 100 years later or something. And what Microsoft are doing is they believe that by exploiting these Majorana fermions, they can create a more stable qubit. And if you get a more stable qubit, um, it will retain its fidelity better, and it will, it will get you closer to a, an actual uh, real commercial proposition for, for quantum computers. It was a fascinating talk. If you can find a video of it, I recommend it. Uh, oh, yeah. And this is one of her slides again. 
Uh, you probably can't read that, but this is a picture of some Microsoft chap. And these topological qubits deliver three to four orders of magnitude better fidelity, according to the writing in the middle of the slide there. So this is their point. This, this is Microsoft's bet. If they can be the first to market uh, with, a, with a usable uh, commercial quantum computer because of this technology. So, what does that mean for the differences between classical and quantum? We're back to our friend in France here. Um, quantum circuits, because of the way that the, the qubits can have more than one value at the same time, and because of the way that uh, effectively they model a probability space rather than a, uh, a definite one or zero, you can process a lot more information uh, in, in, in a high degree of parallelism in a, in a theoretical quantum computer. Um, and it can make problems that cannot be classically solved in reasonable time. We've all heard, I'm sure, stats on the fact that it will take longer than the lifetime of the universe to break RSA encryption or whatever. Um, it's thought that fairly soon quantum computers will be in a position to break RSA, to, to factorize 1,024-bit primes within... Um, usable time. However, here's the drawbacks. You cannot meaningfully persist the state of a quantum program. And the reason is, in order to persist state, you would have to read state. If you read the state, you have squashed the, um, the state of all your bits, all of your qubits, down to a single value. You've lost all the quantum information. So therefore, effectively, a theoretical, and there are real quantum computers, uh, there's no real concept of, of storing a program state. And, uh, and a corollary to that is that it's impossible to debug your program. Because to debug, we all know, we, we've all heard of Heisen bugs, which is a bug that is only there, it goes away when you observe it. Well, <laughs> there's another level of that in quantum computing, which is you can't debug. Um, at the moment, the physical limitations of the hardware limit the breadth and depth of programs. Every time I've gone to a talk on quantum, there's been a slide on supercooling. I don't quite understand why, but to, to get qubits to work, they have to be supercooled. And every time I've heard this, they quote the figure in 0 point something Kelvin, and apparently supercomputers, the IBM Q computer is colder than outer space. <laughs> Who knew? Um, and that's a physical limitation. And also, you have to connect a, a real uh, classical computer to your quantum computer in order to get the quantum computer to do anything. And one of the problems of that is that the classical computer can't be operating at absolute zero because it needs to pass current through it. So the, the interface between the classical computer and the quantum computer is a source of error because that risks leaking heat in and therefore leaking information out of your qubits. And then finally, like I've already said, I think quantum computers are hard to program because I, don't, I just think we're not well designed as human beings to, to understand what's going on. But I'm happy to prove wrong on that. Maybe I'm just a, a rubbish programmer. We'll see. So, what now? What is going on? What, what is there out there now? And as I've said a couple of times, there are some real quantum computers in existence. Um, this is, uh, I'm sure everybody's familiar with Dilbert. Uh, there's a, a bit of a quantum joke in there. Uh, but also, I think, at times in the last few weeks, I've felt a bit like this. I've felt like I've been under the microscope saying, how's your, uh, how's your presentation on quantum coming along? Uh, yet the presentation exists in a simultaneous state of being complete and not complete. And then Gregor, as it is, or the people at ThoughtWorks are saying, can I observe it, can I look at it? And the answer is, uh, well, actually, the answer isn't, that's a tricky question. The answer is, well, no, because it doesn't exist. So happily, it does now exist, and I, and I, hope, it's, uh, I hope it works OK. Um, there is something called the IBM Q experience. Uh, I will show you this website if I get time later. You can log on to it. There's the URL. Um, you can set up an account. It took me moments to set up an account. Uh, and there are two publicly available real quantum computers. Um, every time I've gone on, one of them's been offline. I don't know why that is. Presumably, they do ongoing maintenance. They, who knows? Maybe they have to put spacesuits on to go and clean it or something. I, I really don't know. Um, the interesting thing about these is they're five qubits. Um, and that picture actually is, it means something. Some of the gates, some of the logic gates uh, require two qubits. 
Uh, and the reason why they require two qubits is because uh, they, they get linked together. I don't know if anybody's heard of, oh God, I can't remember the phrase now. Thank you, quantum entanglement. Um, so those gates that I don't understand do that. Um, and the reason why the picture is drawn like that with the lines between the qubits is you can only apparently use qubits that are joined together in gates that, that require two qubits. So the topology of the, of the qubits, the, arrange, the physical arrangement of the qubits uh, actually means something. Um, and you can run real programs on this IBM Q experience. I've seen it done, and I've, I've sort of done it myself, but normally mine come back with results that just mean nothing to me. <laughs> and it also has a quantum simulator. More about quantum simulators later. That's what IBM Q experience looks like. On this slide, I was going to go to the link and show you, but maybe I'll do that later. Microsoft has a thing called Q Sharp, Quantum Development Kit for Visual Studio. Um, this is what I'll be doing a demo on shortly. Uh, it's cool. You can program a quantum computer, and you can execute a, uh, your quantum code. Um, you, can use, uh, you can't execute that code against the real quantum computer yet, but what they have is a, a .NET simulator, which I'll show you, um, which is cool. And that's, that's how I've been writing code. Oh, uh, also, let's go back to here. On this slide, for those that don't want to use Microsoft stuff, I don't, did I mention it on this slide? I can't remember, but somewhere on this page, uh, somewhere on this website here, there is a link to, it might be up there on GitHub, there is a link to a Python development kit, which is what my colleague's been using because uh, he doesn't like Microsoft stuff. So Duncan's been using the Python development kit to, to do his quantum work. Uh, and there, on, obviously, as always, the internet is your friends. There are various people that have done programs in Python and .NET. Um, all of the big players, uh, Google, uh, Microsoft, Intel, AWS, they are all in the race to be the first to get quantum computers to market. This article was written way back in 2010. Uh, to be honest, I didn't find much on the AWS site about what they're doing with quantum now, so I don't know whether they they thought it's not a bet. Um, this article I read, uh, as you can see, March the 5th this was published, and it's saying that this, this phrase crops up a lot, quantum supremacy. Google's moving forward. It's got a 72-qubit computer, so apparently they've got quantum supremacy. Oh, there's Duncan again. Why is Duncan there? The reason why Duncan is there is because if you make a claim of the number of qubits in your system, that doesn't really describe the system. You have to also tell us the fidelity of those qubits and the error rate. So for Google to have a 70 qubit, 72 qubit machine, well, bully for you. But if it's got a really high error rate and the, the, the qubit's fidelity is low, then it's, it's rubbish. So this whole quantum to supremacy thing is a bit fake. It's a bit pie in the sky. Um, here's our French friend again with a slide talking about who's investing money in quantum, and there's some big numbers on there. Um, but I didn't trust that, basically, because I couldn't quite read it. So I've, I found the original, which is here, and apparently this is in 2015. The world invested a billion and a half euros, apparently, in quantum. Uh, but I also read recently that Intel was it spending 50 million a year on, on quantum. So. There's a lot of money being spent, and these numbers are three years old. And obviously, as with everything, as, as the technology gets better, I'm sure more and more will be invested in it. And I think a lot of that is government spending on this slide. And I would imagine there is a shit ton of secret government spending going on in this space as well. Um, and this was an announcement that I read in, a, in an online magazine, which was saying that AWS are, are close to putting something in the cloud. Don't know how true that is. So, what's the commercial proposition? What's the likelihoods? I don't think we're ever going to see quantum computers in the home. There's just too many physical uh, barriers to that. You can't have a cryogenic system in your front room. Uh, apart from anything else, it'd be quite dangerous to go near, I'm sure. Um, and you would need a hugely powerful normal computer to control that quantum computer anyway. But, you know, never say never. IBM in the 1950s said that computers were just purely a business thing. So, who am I to say what could be the case in 50, 100 years' time? Um, there is no reliable, scalable qubit technology yet. Uh, it's, it's just too expensive. These computers, the IBM Q, the Microsoft thing, they're just too expensive to be a commercial proposition. But as I say, all the big players are working on it. 
and what, what we think it will become is some kind of specialist resource. In the same way that when GPUs became a thing back in the 90s, I think, where a specialist way of processing graphical data, um, this is going to be a, a specialist resource in the cloud that people will use for problems that are suited to, to quantum. And Microsoft are quite optimistic about the timescales, uh, although uh, in true fashion, uh, she refused to be drawn when somebody asked her. So what do you need to make a scalable quantum proposition? I shamelessly stole this slide off the Microsoft presentation. Um, you need the scalable qubit foundation. Well, we haven't got that. Um, but as I said earlier, Microsoft's bet is the Majorana topological qubit. They believe that that will give them the, the lead and they will be able to push something out there first. You need cryogenic systems. Um, I've got that in yellow because uh, they exist, but they're really expensive in there. Obviously, they're not particularly scalable. I suppose you could build the computer out in space and have some. I never thought of that, but hey, could build it on the moon. Uh, but the, that wouldn't be cold enough, would it? We've already established that. Um, you need a quantum classical interface. So you need some way of linking your physical computer, your classical computer, to your quantum computer. That's hard to do because, as I say, that leaks state that introduces heat to the system. Um, come on, work clicker. Yeah, error correction. Um, I, I don't fully understand this, but as I say, because of the way that the qubits lose their fidelity over time, there needs to be some way to, to correct errors or to understand how to, to account for errors. Uh, those systems are sort of in development, but they don't really exist yet. And I think they're probably linked to actually what your physical architecture is. So I don't understand that space. A scalable software stack. Uh, what I think was meant by this is um, some way of, of making the, the software accessible between the, um, the, the big special computer that runs the quantum computer and our computers. Uh, I put it in green because it seems easy, but I'm theorizing. Full integration with cloud provider. Of course, on the Microsoft slide, it said full integration with Azure. Could be AWS, could be uh, Google Cloud, whatever. Uh, I don't think that's a problem. I think the stuff underneath is a, is a bigger problem. Uh, once they've got everything else sorted, you know, AWS add features in about a nanosecond, don't they? So don't see that as a problem. And then algorithms and real-world applications. That might or might not be a problem, because as I've said a few times, it's hard to program these things. So that's, that's what needs to happen. Once all this stuff happens, and some people believe that will be in a relatively close time frame. Some people believe it's a bit further off. I believe, I'm pretty certain that it will get there eventually, and at that point, we will have uh, a real scalable solution, and people will start using quantum computers who aren't governments, basically, or research centers. So now, I am going to show you some quantum code. This is where this could go horribly wrong. This could be a massive car crash. What is Clementine's cat? Right, here we go. Here's Clementine's cat again. She is showing her standard mood of indifference. When I was in Vienna, I, I apologize to the one person I can see in the room who was there. I made this joke then. But when I was in Vienna, I applied a quantum transform to the cat to see if she could have lots of different emotions at the same time, because quantum mechanics tells us that you can. So I applied a transform to the cat, and I found, yeah, she can have different emotions. <laughs> All at the same time. Uh, and that was my quantum demonstration when I was uh, in, uh, in Vienna. Now I've, I've got a real quantum demonstration. Uh, I won't take you to all these links, but uh, if you want to take a photo, go ahead. Those are some of the places where you'll find code samples and so on. What I will show you, if I can work out how... Oh, God, how do I get my computer to work? Do I go like this? Ah, that's it. So if I drag this over there, we look at that. So this is the Microsoft um, quantum thing with instructions. Now, this is the tricky part. I'm just going to show you how, to, how you can create uh, some uh, quantum code. So I've, I've already obviously gone through the, the prerequisites there, which is to install the Microsoft Quantum Development Kit and blah, blah, blah. So I now need to get a console window. Now, how do I do that? You would think by now I know how to use a Mac, but I'm pretty useless at it. So here's a console window. Can everybody read that? I can't. <laughs> so 
Actually, I think it would be better if I mirrored the display at this point, wouldn't it? Let's do mirror the display. That's going to help me out, because then I'll be able to see what I'm doing. Ah, oh, excellent. So, uh, I'm in my samples folder, and the Microsoft thing tells me to execute this. .NET new console, no, that's, the, yes, that's it, that's the bit I want. Oh no, I need the output bell, that's not a comment. So basically, I've got the .NET framework installed. I'm going to run that, but I know I've already got something in the folder called bell, so I'm going to call it DevOps PL. Ah! Oh yeah, that's, that's good. So now that should have created a uh, samples, James Burney. Let me see. I should have a new folder called DevOps PL. Is it there? Ah, thank you. That's why I couldn't find it. There you go. Uh, everybody's eyes are better than mine. This is what happens when you get to my age. So with the magic of MS Code, if I do that, that should load my code editor with the code in it. Wow. So there are two parts to a quantum program. This, oh, I need to do this business, don't I? Uh, there's one thing to learn that I learned about this is that the tool set is, is a little bit incomplete. I don't have a, version, a, vis, a license for Visual Studio, so I have to use the community version, uh, and it's a bit rubbish. Um, OK, there's two things. There is a quantum part of the program which you can see there. And there is a classical part of the program, which is written in C sharp. So the quantum program is written in Q sharp. The real program is written in C sharp. And if we go through the steps, what time is it? 12, OK. Uh, we should find, oh god, what did I do? Ah, I didn't mean to do that. How did that happen? Gosh, panic stations. Yeah. Back to there. How do I get back to that? Uh, code. How do I get back? To, ah, there it is. Mirror displays. Thank you. Mirror displays. Right in code. Here we go. This is what I was looking for. And this helpfully tells us, by the way, if you work through this example, you'll find it doesn't compile because uh, one of the, uh, that namespace there where it says namespace quantum.bell is not the same as the namespace in the c -sharp program, so it doesn't compile, and it took me absolutely ages to discover that. So I'm just going to go to the bit where it tells me, yeah, there you go. So I'm going to grab this. And put it into here. All that, this is your quantum program, and all it's saying is uh, get me a qubit and measure its value, whatever that value is. So it's observing it. That's the first line. Let current equal mq1. M stands for measure. It's saying if desired is different from current, then uh, apply the x transform to it. So it's going to flip it from 0 to 1 or from 1 back to 0. It's a really simple program, this example. And then we need another operation, which is going to call set, basically. So what this does is, oh, hang on. You can see I'm an expert in this, can't you? Let's make that a bit bigger so everybody can see it. So this bell test thing, it basically, you tell it how many times to do it, and you tell it what result to set the, the qubit to initially. And it goes through each qubit. You can see that's a fairly traditional looking for loop. It sets the initial value to what you want to set the initial value. It observes the value. And then it says, if it's one, count the number of ones, basically. And then what it returns is the number of ones it found and the number of zeros it's found. And because this is only applying an X transform, that, that leaves the value of the qubit completely deterministic because it's not, it's not applying a Hadamard transform. It's not applying one of those um, hard to understand transforms that the value is always going to stay zero or one. So when you execute this program, it should always give you ones or zeros. Now, 
I know for a fact that that's not going to build. <laughs> so I'm going to go back in true Blue Peter fashion to one that I built earlier. Uh, that happened before. Get out of my way. Get out of my way. And no, that's Clementine's cat. Where's my other quantum program gone? I'll tell you what, let me open it. So I've done that mirroring screen thing again. Mirror displays. And don't. Oh, no, mirror displays is what I want, isn't it? Ah. Right. So if I go back to this folder, all these samples. By the way, these samples are downloadable from that Microsoft page. Uh, I haven't had time to go through all of them. I'm going to load this one called measurement. This was one I was playing with yesterday. Uh, there are various things that go on in, in this which uh, measure. As you can see, I was using it earlier. How do you execute a quantum program? So let's go through the pieces of this quickly. So this, this bit here, the C-sharp program, as I say, this, this is the thing that actually runs your quantum code. As you can see, it creates a simulator there. And then the simulator gets passed to the run method of the, the quantum code, of the quantum program. And then what, what the quantum program returns is a tuple of results, however many you want it to be. And those results are always, as far as I can tell, of the type simulation core dot result, which is basically an enum that has one or zero in it. So that's, that's all you get out of your quantum program. You get a tuple of zeros and ones. What this program does is it, there are four, three or four things it does. It measures one qubit that's had the Hadamard transform applied to it and tells us how many times it is storing the value one and how many times it's sort of not storing, how many times it tells us its value is one and how many times it tells us it's zero. Then it does something with two qubits where, again, it applies the Hadamard transform to the two qubits and sees what happens when it observes the value. And then the third part is measurement of Bell basis, uh, which applies the Hadamard, then the CNOT gate. I don't fully understand it, but I believe that is the, um, the, the uh, Schrodinger's cat transform, effectively. So let's run this program. I'm going to start again. Can everybody read that OK? Yeah. So I'm going to build the program. And by the way, if you, God help you, if you, I'll show you what happens, but I'll come back to that. So I'm going to run the program. So the first bit of output tells us that 48% of the time, after applying the Hadamard transform, we got a zero. So you can see that's close to 50%, but it isn't 50%. So there's, there's some interesting probabilistic stuff going on there. I think it runs it 100 times. Then in here, you see you're applying the Hadamard transform to two qubits. Sometimes you get 1-1, one, one, sometimes you get 0-0, zero, zero, sometimes you get 1-0. Uh, we haven't got a 0-1 there, but I'm sure if we ran it again, we'd probably get some 0-1s. Um, and now with the c not gate, ah, oh yes. This, uh, the reason why they're all the same, they're either 0-0 zero, zero or 1-1, one, one, is because the c not gate uh, does um, quantum entanglement on your qubits. So the two qubits that go through the c not gate are, are tangled together so that they will both, they're guaranteed now to return the same value when you observe them. So composing things like that together is how you can make uh, complex programs. And that's something I added with four qubits in. I forgot I'd done that. That was when I was experimenting. So it's similar to the one earlier that just observes the Hadamard transform. Now, so that's, that's a simple quantum program. As promised, I will now show you the one that I wrote, Clementine's Cat. I have genuinely written a program that simulates my cat at home. Now, what this program does, let's go through it. Right at the very top there, you can see I make an array of four qubits. The four qubits represent the four members of my family, myself, my wife, Josie, and my two daughters, Clementine and Felicity. What do we do with those qubits? Now, each qubit, we apply the Hadamard transform to it. So apply to each H qubits. So I've now got four qubits in superposition. And what will happen is, if I observe a zero, the cat then comes to us. I'm sure anybody that owns a cat, their cat does this. The cat will come up to my wife first and beg for food. And she may or may not give it food, depending on whether she thinks that I've fed it already. The cat then eats the food, immediately forgets that it's had its food, but remembers somehow which human it's already asked for food. 
So whether or not my wife feeds it, the cat will then come to me and ask for food. Whether or not I feed it, it will go to my daughter for food and then my other daughter. So what we're going to model here is the possibility, the probability of the cat being happy. So our cat being a cat just like any other, she's happy if at least two humans feed her. So here's the interesting part. All I can do from my quantum program there's an assertion there, uh, which I got from the Microsoft bit. And on each qubit in turn, we're just checking that they're in their correct state. Uh, I, to be honest, it's not really part of the program. It's, it's, it's almost like a, uh, a debug statement, I guess. Um, and then the result, basically, that M reset Z statement, what that means is measure it and reset the qubit. For some reason, which I haven't got to the bottom of yet, in order to recycle a qubit, it's, it has to have the, the value of zero. You, you can't destroy it without that. I, I have no idea why. Um, anyway, and then the result is returned. So what we're getting back is a tuple with four values in it. That's all you can get out of your quantum computer. So you then have to go into your C-sharp code and interpret what those results mean. So you can see here in the C-sharp code, I've got... Uh, I, I couldn't... I, it's so long since I've used C-sharp, and I was, I was so last minute with everything, unfortunately, that I wrote this this morning and I couldn't find a more elegant way to iterate through the four qubits and get their states than, than that. So this code is utter rubbish. Please tell me how I can write this better. I, I just... Phew. Anyway, so what it's going to do is, that final line, system console write line, it's going to... You can see if the cat gets fed greater than or equal to two times, it's going to be happy. If it, get, if it doesn't get fed greater than or equal to two times, it won't be happy. So let's see what happens. This is simulating Clementine's cat. If it doesn't build, I'll cry, because I haven't got time to fix it. .NET run. Let's see if the cat gets happy. It's going to run 100 times. Oh! There you go. As you can see, sometimes it's happy, sometimes it's not. OK. And that's Clementine's cat. And as we can see, if we scroll through, about half the time she's happy, and about half the time she's looking for a new family that will feed her more frequently. Okay, that is Clementine's cat. Thank you all for indulging me with that, uh, as I now try and get back to my presentation. So, I've got a couple of minutes to whiz through what do I see in the future. This is being really heavily worked on. Organic molecules are so complex that we cannot model them using traditional computers. Um, caffeine, I was told by the Microsoft lady, is about the most complex thing we can model. So there's, there's really, that's an area that's being looked into. Everybody, I think a lot of people will have heard of the Harbor process. It's for making, uh, fixing atmospheric nitrogen and making fertilizer. It currently takes 3 to 5% of the world's entire supply of natural gas goes into that production. So if we knew what was actually going on in those molecules and people are starting to work on this, how do beans... Farmers for centuries have done crop rotation, but we don't know how that works. We don't know how the bean molecules uh, work with, uh, to create. So simulating that is, is massive business, potentially. As I say, nitrogen fixation, understanding and fighting disease, carbon capture, it's already being used for traffic flow, weather forecasting, and financial markets, and so on. And the final point is this. What happens to cryptography? All the big players are already working on cryptography post-quantum, um, post so it should be safe. My final thing I'll leave with my French friends. This is their slide, and that, that is everybody's view on when things will be ready. There is a paper on that URL that tells you, well, they'll never work if you believe the pessimists. And finally, I'll leave the last word to Duncan. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. I hope you got something out of it.